Uh, I'm Marina Mahadev. I'm basically a writer. I write a, a fortnightly column uh, in the Star newspaper. And I also sit on the board of Sisters in Islam. And uh, we work on justice and equality for Muslim women in Malaysia. Right. The institutions, I suppose the main institution would be uh, Jakim, which is located in the Prime Minister's Department, uh, Islamic Development uh, Department. Um, and I guess the stakeholders would be uh, government, the religious officials, and I suppose uh, the Muslim population of Malaysia, uh, on which it has uh, the most impact on these uh, policies and laws. Thank you for that. And the other, I suppose, the other, uh, given the way that Malaysia is structured, the other institutions would be the state religious departments, which are. Um, powers in their own right. Yeah. No, I agree with him. I think it's often a matter of education. Uh, the word secular has been demonized so much that people seem to think that it's anti-religion. Uh, therefore, if you are a secularist, you must be anti-religion. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the West, the most prominent secularists are the you know, anti-religion people. Um, so, it's... it's um, it's been put as a, a black and white situation, either you have religion or you don't. Um, but actually it just means a, a, a form of governance. It's not that people don't believe, it's just that people are free to believe whatever they want and the state has no religion. I think that's, that's the main thing. The state has no uh, religion by itself. Uh, and therefore does not direct laws and policies based on any particular religious uh, faith. In, in truth, I think every uh, country um, is a mixture. Uh, very few of them, I suppose uh, apart from maybe Communist China or something, uh, does not invoke God or some faith in some way. <clears throat> but the point really is that as long as it, it does not direct policies um, and laws, then it's fine. Uh, but in Malaysia, where we have a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society, um, the use of just one religion to direct policies is problematic, obviously, for those who don't adhere to it. Thank you. <clears throat> well, of course, there has been a counter-reaction, uh, mostly from non-Muslims. Um, for Muslims, uh, I think there's been a, a bit of both uh, because a lot of Muslims in this country unfortunately do not have much uh, religious education beyond uh, rituals and, and sort of the very basic stuff. Not much about ethics or you know the, the justice that is inherent in Islam. Um, they seem to think that Islamization is a must and therefore, uh, you know, you shouldn't question it. Um, Islamization with a small i actually should not be problematic because if Islam stands for justice and equality, it just means that all your laws and policies should be based on justice and equality and human rights, in fact, because Islam does stand for human rights. But the way it's been put forward, it is a particular interpretation of Islam, which is straight, very narrow, uh, often very patriarchal, um, and very exclusive rather than inclusive. And therefore, this is problematic not just to non-Muslims who are excluded from it all, um, but also to uh, Muslims themselves, because very often, the human interpretation doesn't interpret into the principles that Islam stands for, which is justice and equality. Um, a fine example is really the impact on women, uh, the various laws for polygamy, for instance, uh, family laws, marriage, divorce, um, polygamy, inheritance, guardianship, etc., um, is problematic uh, because it's based on one interpretation, very narrow, very patriarchal interpretation where women have less rights. So, so yeah, so there, there are many issues uh, involved with it. Um, I, it all stems from the idea that 
of what what Islamization means. Islamization uh, means something that is interpreted by a group of people in the narrowest narrow sense. Whereas, if you want to take it as broadly as possible, uh, Islamization should mean respect for all human rights, should mean justice, should mean equality. No, we don't have to accept anything. <laughs> you know, I mean. All religions, including Islam, were actually revolutions. Uh, they came about because people did not accept the norm and the standards at the time, you know. It's, it was often a rebellion against something. Islam definitely was. It was a, a rebellion against tribalism. It was a rebellion against the um, uh, practices of the day, including, you know, discrimination against women and girls. You know, they used to kill baby girls as soon as they were born and that sort of thing. So actually to me, uh, to be truly Islamic, you should always be questioning uh, the norms. Um, for women, of course, it's difficult because uh, the, the interpretation that we see every day around us uh, is a patriarchal interpretation. There are many people, for instance, who believe that women should never lead. Women cannot lead. Um, and this translates into like even some female politicians saying, oh, they cannot ever be Menteri Besar because that would mean uh, they can't accompany the Sultan for religious rituals, etc, etc. Um, but that's ridiculous because, you know, the sole function, uh, the, the function of the, the MB is more than just religious rituals. He's supposed to govern. And you're supposed to govern with justice and equality and surely women are able to do that. There, there isn't anything that makes women less just, you know, uh, than, than male rulers. And in fact, uh, if you read the Quran, um, when it talks about women, it tends to talk in very positive ways. Uh, there's a whole chapter called Anisa, which is called women. There is a whole chapter on uh, Maryam, uh, Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. And there are mentions of the Queen of Sheba, Belkis, uh, for her very good uh, leadership attributes. Uh, that she was a fair and just ruler and, and that sort of thing. Women are mentioned very positively. So, you know, we could choose. We could choose if we wanted to, to take these fine examples uh, that I mentioned in the Quran um, and say for instance hold up Bilkis as the role model for a leader but we don't, why don't we? because it's been men who's been interpreting uh, the Quran all this time and naturally they will neglect to mention the women because they live in patriarchal societies and they've just simply handed this down um, you know so you know when, when Islam came uh, to, to the world uh, over 1,400 years ago, it was revolutionary. It stopped the, the killing of baby girls. It gave women the right to um, choose their own husbands. It gave women um, a say in, in, in uh, public policy, you know, and they could talk, and very frequently women could talk in public places, could ask directly uh, the prophet, uh, for you know answers on uh, all these things. In fact, uh, it's said that the chapter on Anisa on the women came down because the women asked the prophet, "How come all the revelations only talk about men, men, men? How come? Uh, why are we excluded?" And then the whole revelation, the chapter on women came down, and and throughout the Quran it mentions. Uh, for believing men and believing women, believing men and believing women, always, always, always. So, you know, God does not discriminate, you know, we are all uh, creatures of God, but human beings do. And that's the problem, we're dealing with human beings here, with all their, their prejudices, biases, quirks, foibles, whatever, depending on the societies that we live in. And, and this has been carried on as if it's sacrosanct, as if it has been brought down. I mean, when you think about it, what sort of God creates all these uh, living things and then discriminates between them? Uh, it doesn't make sense uh, if you think of God as om omnipotent, omnipresent and all that. But if you think of human beings, then it makes sense.
Because human beings like to discriminate. They like to take privileged positions for themselves. And so for men, taking a privileged position and putting women down is very beneficial for them. And But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of women have taken this on because they don't read the Quran for themselves. And that's what's been revolutionary about what Sisters is doing and many similar women's groups and Muslim women's groups around the world have been doing that we are going back to the text and looking at it ourselves and looking at more progressive interpretations of it um, and seeing that hey you know a lot of the things that we've been told simply not true it's simply not true like you know, like the polygamy verse, for instance, everyone likes to quote, oh, in Islam, men are allowed to marry four wives at a time. But when you look at it, number one, the whole verse actually is not about marriage. It's about taking care of widows and orphans. How do you take care of widows and orphans after a war? Uh, because women at the time, you know, had no means to support themselves and were very vulnerable uh, and all that. So they had to come under a male household, you know, some sort of guardianship. So you're allowed to marry more than one. And this was a time when people used to marry lots and lots and lots of women. So four was a limitation. And therefore, it, it's seen as the actual guidance is to reduce. And there's also the verse, so it does say you can marry two or three or four. But it also says that the line after that, which everyone likes to neglect, so it says, but you know, if you cannot be fair to all, then marry just one. Because the best is just one. So that's the best. So why are we not adhering to, to the, you know, the, uh, the best standard, which is one, instead going for lower standards, if you like, and going for, for polygamy. Um, so that's the question that, that you know, my, my organization brings up. And, it upsets a lot of people because very often they didn't realize that's what the Quran says. Well, I mean, CIS conducts a lot of uh, workshops and trainings for all sorts of women and not just limited to um, urban women, shall we say. Um, and actually, I, I actually find um, middle class, well off women more problematic than, um, than rural women because you know, and, and taking this example from my days uh, working in HIV, um, if I go and talk to women in like semi-rural, rural areas about women and AIDS and talking about how women get infected and, and not just sort of medical terms, but the fact that they get uh, infected often from their own husbands, rural women, semi-rural women, they get it instantly. They understand it. And they'll say to me, so Marina, what else do we have to suffer from, you know, from men? Because they're used to being discriminated against. You know, it happens all the time. You, you see that they work the land and yet they have no rights to it. You know, so this type of discrimination, constant injustice is something they are used to. So to me, they are, they are natural feminists, I like to call them, because they get it instantly. Whereas urban women, middle class women, they live in great comfort and they, they always think that as long as they are comfortable, they have their nice home, nice car and all that, it's okay. They will put up with this type of discriminations. So I was tell them why you all feel comfortable and all that, but behind the bedroom door, are you just as comfortable? Are you, you know, angry about something? They, they won't, they won't, uh, they find it hard to admit to that because, you know, they don't want to give up all this comfort. Whereas for rural women, you know, working class women, women lower income, they are used to discomfort every day, you know, they don't have that much else to lose. And we find that when we go and talk about, like, legal issues for women in wherever workshops, the women are really interested because all of them have experienced some sort of issue like with the courts or something they've all experienced it so they're very interested in in uh, you know getting justice in the courts and all that so i don't i don't know whether 
whether you know yes you know yes we are middle class educated elite talking about it but then i think all revolutions and all they yeah, are led by by people who are more educated um at least the seed of it to get the ideas going then the actual work might be done by 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 others but you know this discrimination cuts across all classes really uh, because the the overarching or the most dominant class is the is the is the male you know so it, it has to go back to education i mean that's the problem actually is it it's all about education because we all like to think that we've been educated in religion but whatever we have we been educated in myself included is that we've learned to read, read the quran in arabic it, it, which is a language we don't understand we might have some of it translated for us but not all of it so we we don't understand the nuances of the arabic language and it's classical arabic by the way it's not even modern day arabic yeah so we learn that we can read the entire quran and some people even um memorize the entire quran but they don't understand what it's saying that's that's one the other thing we are educated in rituals you know how to pray how to fast how to go on the hajj you know how and, and nowadays that like even more and more rules you know like 10 million ways you can do it wrong rather than the few ways that you can do it right you know when i was little what i was always told is that islam is a very easy religion because the things that you're not supposed to do are very big things and therefore it's very easy to know when you've transgressed right and yet there are many 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 little things um that you can do that are good that are considered good you know but nowadays there are like 10 million things that you can do that's wrong and very few things that you can do that's good so it's complete opposite so it's, it's a matter of uh, the education you know um and and uh it's it's uh it's a bit sad uh because people get really really um uh obsessed with the diminutive you know <laughs> whether you sit properly when you pray or you know you, you just get completely obsessed um which is you know i don't i mean me personally, I don't think that God is that obsessed. He's not OCD about whether you've, you've done everything perfectly. It's your intention. You know, we always say everything is about niat. It's all your intention, whether you know you have good intention or not. And one of the things that I love most about my religion is this saying that if you think, you know, we have this thing about pahala and dosa, you know, uh, merit and sin. Uh, when you do good things, you get married, and when you do bad things, it's a sin, right? Um, and everything is like in an accounts book, which will be totaled up on Judgment Day, and you see which way it goes, right? Um, and what I like most about it is that if you even think of doing something good, you already get points. Whereas if you think of doing something bad, then the recording angels that are supposed to be by your side wait until you actually do it so you can get really angry with someone and you think i want to kill that person but you don't get any demerits for it until you actually do it which is highly unlikely most times but if you think of something good to do you instantly get married and i think that's great that's you know that's so you know niat is everything what what your real niat is but everyone gets so worked up about what type, you know, even if you cover your head, what type of scarf you wear, whether one little strand is showing or not. I mean, I think it's a bit insulting to God to think that he's so, you know, compulsive, or obsessive compulsive about these little things. When really you should be spending your time thinking about how you can, you know, do the things that God wants you to do as this thing in the Quran. I, I think one definitely education, you know, um, a very progressive 
uh, interpretation of Islam I think is important and it goes side by side with uh, education about human rights, democracy, etc, etc, you know, because all of these things go together and they, they are not at all incompatible, you know, I hate this idea that uh, you have Islam on one side, human rights on the other side, it's ridiculous because they should be the same thing and, and to me, uh, there is no Islamic version of human rights either. I mean, let, let's not forget the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if you look at it carefully, there's nothing you can argue with it. And that the people who um, who uh, established it in the first place included Muslims, you know, very very prominent Muslims. So I don't see what the problem is. I think the problem is people over interpreting everything. Like, oh, if we have this, then in the future, you know, people might want to do this and do that. I mean, really, <laughs> you know, it's it's again. I think people just being OCD about details you know but I, education is very important there are a lot of progressive scholars around the world we can choose to follow them if we want uh, but instead we choose uh, to follow the worst ones it's a choice you know it's a choice I think um, to, again to me the beauty of Islam is that we do not have one central authority we do not have priests you know, we are allowed, each one of us is allowed to interpret it the way we want. Because we have to be educated about it. We can't simply make up. And the source is the Quran. And a little bit the Hadith. And then you have to be very careful of which Hadith you pick because there are a lot of fake ones as well. But as long as they don't contradict the Quran, then you're fine. You know, so the, the main thing is to follow the Quran. Um, we don't need interpreters. We don't need any middleman. You have a direct line to God, you know. That's the beauty and the dem democracy of Islam. Right? It is totally democratic in that way that you don't need other people to interpret for you. So I think that's really, you know, what we need. I, I, whether it's going to happen is, is really, it's a matter of leadership as always. It is always a matter of leadership. Um, if we have leadership that is wishy-washy uh, about religion or thinks that religion is a great tool for politics, which is what we see now, then you're going to get a situation that we have now, you know, where it's totally mixed up and it's very dangerous because obviously, you know, in a multicultural, multi-ethnic society where not everybody has the same religion, using one is going to be... Uh, discriminatory by itself, by nature, it has to be discriminatory, that's one. Um, the other thing is really, I mean, we are, we are incredibly bureaucratic, you know, I have a cousin who, uh, no, a cousin, a friend who married, who's Muslim from Malaysia, who married an American and they came back here to get married and the, the guy, the American guy said something to me which was very, very, um, really made me think a lot. He said, you know, you're so bureaucratic here. You know, I can only be a Muslim if after I've signed some forms and things, I have to fill in all these forms, I have to go to the, this office, and, and then only I become a Muslim. So the day before I sign the form, I'm not a Muslim. The day after I sign the form, I'm a Muslim. But in America, I just have to declare. I just have to recite. There is no God but God, and my prophet is the uh, the prophet is the messenger of God, and I'm a Muslim. That's it. You know, because that's about faith. Whereas here, we don't care about faith. We care about bureaucracy, whether people have filled in the the right forms or not. And there are endless ridiculous stories. I had a friend who converted, and uh, first he was told he didn't have to change his name. And then someone said, no, you have to have a Muslim name. So he chose Adam. And when he went, they said, okay, what's your Muslim name? He said, Adam. He said, oh, you can't have Adam. That's not a Muslim name. And he said, no, it's not Adam. It's Adam. Ah, Adam. Okay, fine. I mean, that's the sort of stupid stories that you have. Uh, you know, this obsessive compulsive disorder that a lot of these people have about details. Whereas, you know, 
gosh, you know, um, what's in the name? <laughs> you know, it's about faith. It's so in Malaysia, unfortunately, to me, it's completely faithless society in many ways because it's not about faith at all. It's not about faith and belief and ethics at all. It's about bureaucracy. And, and that's what we have to get rid of. You can only get rid of that uh, by taking the state out of religion. Um, unfortunately, I think um, if you try and do that now, you put a lot of people out of work. A lot, because we have a huge Islamic bureaucracy. All these people will be out of work, and there's a huge vote bank that they're afraid to lose, right? So, so it's not going to happen anytime soon. But really, you know, we should be dismantling rather than uh, adding on. I mean, Jakim gets a budget of 700 million. That's more than a lot of other departments that you have to wonder what it's for. You know, so, and they have to make work for themselves, right? Hence, you get all these ridiculous fatwas and things like that. So, yeah, all this, really, it's bureaucracy and nothing else and politics.